Hi, I'm Dario, and welcome to the first full-length episode of Tour Talk. In this episode, myself and Nate catch up with our good friend Dan Reed from the Dan Reed Network. Dan's an awesome artist and someone who I've been working with for the last five or six years. I actually managed to get Dan and Nate introduced to each other earlier this year whilst we were out in Portland, Oregon working on the upcoming Dan Reed Network record. Not the first Dan Reed solo album, as I happen to say in the podcast. We cover quite a lot of ground in this first episode, including some really cool stories on the guys' favourite gig experiences, what can go wrong at shows, times they've nearly died on the road, and every week I'll be pulling a topic at random to throw at our guests to see if they can actually be interesting on the spot. Anyway, really hope you guys enjoy this, and here's the shameless plug part. If you did, please follow us on the socials at Tour Talk Pod on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel Tour Talk Pod to watch episodes online. If you feel like seeing our faces, we'll add to your podcast experience. All right, thank you very much for joining us on the first episode of Tour Talk Down Read. This, this is, is the first cool. episode. Yeah, this is the first episode. So I'm sorry if it goes a little up and down, but we'll. I think we'll be wow. okay. That's pretty cool. As my, as my son would say, what the bleep? <laughs> <laughs> How old's your son? He's eight. He says bleep. And he already says bleep. That's amazing. Yeah, he goes, yeah. what the bleep? <laughs> that'll, change in t- that'll change in two years. I know, you know? right? Yeah. I'm going to enjoy change. the bleep while it lasts. <laughs> It's um, it's obviously it's really cool to have you on the first episode because obviously we've worked together um for a few years and yeah. you and Nate obviously met earlier this year and did some shows together, which is ideal yeah. for the purpose of this podcast because it's all about touring and what happens whilst we're on tour. So, um, I don't know. Do you want to go back to January and when you guys met? I think it was pretty cool whilst we were in Portland working on the first Dan Reed record. Yep, yeah, and. Uh... I remember just Dario saying such great things about your, you as a person, number one, Nate. And then, um, God, he's a liar. <laughs> yeah, no, really just, he thought we would click really well, you know? And when you came over to the studio, I felt like within five minutes we were like buddies, you know? Yeah. I, it, it was definitely a, a, a quick, um, the connection was very apparent. And we have a, we all have a good twisted sense of humor, which I think is <laughs> important. <laughs> Especially when uh, I think people don't realize that when you're spending so much time with other guy friends, you know, out on the road and traveling, that um, just being able to have a, a sense of humor about yourself and not having your ego out of control is like it's primary in, in order for yeah. people to get along and you know not have it be a miserable experience. Yeah, I don't know if you remember like the first five or ten minutes of like Nate arriving, but. You were sat on the sofa um, working on the acoustic version of uh, yeah. Blame It on the Moon, which was really cool. And I remember Nate's face whilst you were singing that chorus, because I know you were really taken by that song almost immediately. It blew me. It literally. So so <laughs> let me get, quick give you a little backstory to the trip. Um, I left D.C. at maybe at some point in the afternoon, and I had eaten um, like a some kind of salad at the airport bar. And it, it had, there was food poisoning involved in the situation. And halfway through the flight, I was emptying trash bags of vomit in the bathroom. It, I mean, it, I was like, it was coming out of all ends. It was just, it was one of the worst food poisoning experiences I had ever had. And I literally spent three hours of the five hour flight, six hour flight or whatever in the um, bathroom. You know, like locked in this bathroom, and the stewardesses were coming to check on me, and I was like, dr- I was just like, I was as sick as I have, have ever been from food poisoning. And then I took the Uber to that studio, and I rolled in, and you guys immediately had pulled out maybe like a couple pre roll joints from the um, dispensary. Yep. I took a couple of hits and immediately just felt better than I had felt all day. I mean, I was miserably sick. And. Uh, then you guys had started working on that song and it was just one of those moments where I went from complete misery to complete bliss in like a matter of a minute. And it, it just, it's, you know, it's stuck in my mind that, that, that song was not only amazing, but the rearrangement of it for the acoustic version just, it like floored me. So that was my experience in, in meeting you for the first, for the first time. 
We should definitely make weed illegal in Oregon again then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Since ban it. it. You perfectly. Yeah. What for me was then was great was that Brian James passed you a guitar and yeah. was like, sing me something. Yeah, that was like, miserable. That there. was the most, mi- <laughs> what a miserable fucking thing to do. Like, I couldn't have imagined, I was stoned out of my mind and like, finally feeling better from food poisoning and you were like and both you and Brian were like hey sing sing something for me and I'm like oh Jesus Christ like I can't imagine a worse fucking uh, thing to be asked to do right now I just wanted to crawl into a corner and just and die but it was cool but I you mean, killed I, I, it after both I did it Brian I was like alright that's fine away. yeah Brian still talks about you from that oh, one that's moment re- that's cool yeah, yeah. you really it was a really cool trial by fire, I thought. I think that was a very <laughs> artistic introduction to yeah. meeting each yeah. other. It was wild. Yeah, there's nothing like meeting somebody you admire musically like for the first time ever, and in the first 10 minutes, they're like, hey, sing a song for me, you fucking idiot. And I well, did. We, and then Brian and I are always kind of like that when we meet somebody. It's not so much about, like, uh, what do you call it, musicianship as far as, like, you know, uh, if you're a shredder or you know you know know how to read music or anything like that it's like where's your heart coming from and like sure, when you, play, sure. when you play a song and when dario had said so many great things about you we're just like i gotta just hear you sing a song in the room and it was amazing and i appreciate uh, that i'm always well, nervous right. to go into somebody else's studio session you know what i mean because <laughs> i know how i am in my studio sessions it's like i don't want anybody there I don't want to fucking know new people. First off, I don't want to know new people anyway. I'm very different than you, Dan. Dan Dan is an open book and loves meeting people and connecting, and I'm way more like I'm very cautious and nervous, especially um, because this solo thing for me is brand new. So I'm very uh, yeah. self-conscious about people hearing me without a, a name of a band attached to me. And right. I know you, you've done something similar in your career too with doing your own solo thing, and so for me, it's um, yeah, I'm just in I'm in just in this weird position where I'm un- a little more uncomfortable than I normally would be. Right. So that was a um, I really appreciated the you were a very gracious host, even though you didn't make me make me perform when I was <laughs> sick and high out of my mind. But other than that, it was a, it was a really it was an honor to just kind of have that exchange, and then I felt very connected to you after. So I, I guess that was the point of the whole thing. Well, I know the feeling. I remember the first time I did an acoustic show um, without anybody behind me with the band or beside me. And it was terrifying, just the first song and, and seeing how people reacted. And then I had to start thinking about my, uh, my mother used to be a performer in the USO tours back in the day. Wow. And she was saying that, you know, to get over any kind of nerves, she's, I remember her saying this when she was singing in church. And she was always like the loudest one singing in church. And I was kind of embarrassed, but she had this great vibrato and she was always in tune. And I was like, oh, kind of proud, but also kind of embarrassed. Like, mom, can't you sing a little quieter and all that? But she said uh, that whenever you're feeling nervous, you just got to remind yourself that everybody in the audience that is watching, whether it's five people or 5,000 people are rooting for you to do well. They're not, no one's up there going, no one's out there going, I hope this person sucks. So yeah. as soon as as soon as you accept that everybody's rooting for you, yeah, that it doesn't matter if you sing like Mick Jagger, which is just like all over the place, or if you uh, sing like Pavarotti, or if you whatever it doesn't matter, as long as you sing from the heart and you're and you know that they're rooting for you in the audience, yeah, that you, your nerves just kind of wash away, and then you just kind of you're just being honest in the moment. And either yeah. there's going to be people that out there that go, that fucking sock, you know? And then there's going to be people. Can we swear on this thing? I don't yeah. Know. yeah you can oh, yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, or if they go, uh, you know, that was that really touched me. Usually it's about honesty, you know? Like, I, I think of actors like Gene Hackman. Not a movie star looking guy. Right. Mm-hmm. Right? He's not a pinup boy. Yet every time you see him on screen, you believe everything he's doing. And he's just right. he's just so honest with the other actors in the scene. Right. He's so disconnected to the process of the camera being in the room. He's just talking to other actors. And I always think about that when I'm when I'm singing, like Amazing. solo shows, especially. Yeah. Once you get a drum set behind you, and you know this, like rocking guitars and yeah. bass thumping and all that, you start <clears throat> adding airs a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know? 
you got to live up to the drum beat and all this. So you start yeah. performing a little more. But when you're solo acoustic, it's really just about the throat and uh, the dynamics on the guitar. Yeah. And if you can be honest with that, it's uh, that's half the battle. But what what's interesting about that, right? So like, I have this weird, um, I guess you would you could probably call it Jewish guilt, where <laughs> where I I also feel that when people are rooting for you, yeah. the pressure of not letting them down, right? Yeah. So like that yeah. also is. It, I learned so much from watching you and um, Danny um through the process do you know what i mean like yeah. through the process of watching you guys do those shows uh, from the first show and we only did three shows together yeah but from the first show to the last night i learned so much especially and i'll never forget this actually the the last of the three sweden shows that audience was really tough they were in that hotel bar yeah. and they were they were pounding drinks yeah and i remember actually this there was a table of of six guys and they were they were dr drinking and just talking through the whole set. Yeah. And halfway through the set, I walked up to their table. I stopped the whole set and I took the guy's beer off the table and I, you know, I drank it. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and, and, um, it works kind of, right? Yeah. That was the moment where I realized like I was in control, I guess, of the situation yeah. instead Absolutely. of letting that guilt or the pressure crush me. Um, mm -hmm. so I learned a lot from you guys, uh, about honesty and kind of living in the moment on stage during that during that tour. Well, humor is all is. I mean, you go up and grabbing his beer to those guys is hilarious, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, they didn't punch me, cool. so it went away. Yeah, went, no. Okay. They, it's it's just perfectly ballsy and perfectly uh, you know humbling at the same time. It's great. <laughs> I mean, what I will say is that the first time I met Dan, he didn't ask me to sing a note. <laughs> I think that's probably for the best. Because I don't know whether we'd still be friends now if I had to, had to perform at that point. Yeah, Dory, you have many talents, and singing is not one of them. Singing is not <laughs> one of them. I am well aware. I've never really <laughs> heard you sing, Dory. I've known I've known you for what four years now. I'm yeah. I'm doing you a favor. Let's just leave it. Five at that. years. I don't think I've ever heard you just break out in song on the tour bus or backstage or nothing. I, I, you know, I like being an enigma with some things. Some things I've got to hold back, you know, for a special occasion. No, yeah. bullshit. If you're that handsome, if you're as handsome as Dario is and you can sing and you're not, do you know what I'm saying? If he could sing, he'd be doing it. You yeah, know what, I'm, you know what sing, I'm saying? Neither you <laughs> or I would know him. He's, we not, wearing know him if he could sing. he's not wearing baggy clothes over there. You know what I'm saying? He's not hiding anything. He's, he's putting hey, everything he has forward. Hey, this is a podcast about touring. Let's, <laughs> let's stick to the program. Let's not jump on me. Um, all right. So I got a couple of touring related questions or topics for you. Um, the first one I kind of picked out because I haven't got a good story for this or, but I have a feeling that both of you might. Um, so have you ever had any sort of near death experience either on stage or just on the road, on a tour bus, on a plane, anything like that, that I mean, basically I've got nothing apart from like driving a, a van in the snow or being on a stage where there's like, it's live, like there's electricity running through the stage. I've got nothing. But right. I have a feeling that one of you guys might have a more interesting tale to tell than that. Uh, yeah, I'll make it real quick. In Oregon on, I believe 81 is the highway that goes through, is 81 what goes through Oregon? 84. 80, 84. On 84, um, maybe like in an hour or two hours a handful of hours outside of going to Portland to play a show, um, I was driving a 15-passenger a, a van with a trailer, a loaded um, single-axle trailer, hit a patch of black ice yeah. um, on the side of a mountain, and flipped the van, flipped the van and trailer over. Um, it was single-handedly the craziest thing I've probably ever experienced in my life, and I think I probably have a little... Driving PTSD from it, um, but yeah, it happened at seven o'clock in the morning. We were actually doing my, my old band Lion Eyes. We were doing shows with this band. I'll, I'll put it in context very quickly, but we were on a two-month 
by Coastal Tour. So 25 days and 25 days with this band called Streetlight Manifesto. And in the middle of the tour where we would have had a week off kind of in between the things, our yeah. buddies in the band Clutch invited us to go play two sold out nights at St. Andrews Hall in Detroit. I know so that we, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. So we drove from Florida on the last day of, of this other tour. We drove, we deadheaded it to Detroit, played the two days in Detroit, and then that night after the last show, we started driving to the West Coast from the middle of the country. And we had two or three days to get there, and it was everything was cool. But, you know, the drummer from Clutch, who's a very close friend of ours, at the end of the night, we had all had some drinks. I was sober. I was the first one to drive out. Okay. And he said, I got a weird feeling, man. Just go real, like, don't drive through the night. Just start driving in the morning. It's getting cold. It's November, you know, like, mm. just just chill. And we were like, we got to, we don't have money for a hotel. We got to just get to the next place. Mm. So 36 hours into the trip, it's my turn again to drive. So it's like, you know, a day and past, and we're in, we're five hours, four hours outside of Portland and it's seven in the morning. So I wake up from sleeping through the night and we've been driving, switch drivers. I get a cup of coffee and it's starting to snow a little bit, but it's not, it's just flurries. And we're coming down this mountain pass and we hit this, uh, you know, the, the signs that say bridges freeze before yeah. the road. We <clears> hit, <throat> we, we hit one of those and we were going, I was only going 30 miles an hour. Wow. Hit wow. it. And I just woke everyone up as I lost control of the van within 15 seconds. And I just said, everyone fucking brace for this. Like, just hold on, hold on, hold on. As soon as I said it, and a couple guys were in the bench seats sleeping. So they didn't have their seatbelts on. So the van flips. We hit the side of the, we luckily go to the side of the mountain where it's going up the mountain. Because the other way would have, I mean, we would have been dead without a question. It was a, a mile up. And... Uh, the van hits the roof, teeters back on its side. The, you know, the glass blows out and the guys had, it, because it hit the roof first and then rolled over the, uh, the guys would have been cut in half that were sleeping yeah, yeah. in the bench. Yeah, yeah. So they, they hit the ground and the glass the, at the same time, as opposed to, um, going through the as, window exactly and then getting so yeah. they had some road burn but we basically <clears throat> so the trailers completely flipped weirdly enough most of the gear didn't get destroyed like we had That's an or, a, a full organ packing yeah it's really crazy so they we w the van's on its side and our i'm down i'm like down and the tour manager's up here and i'm like hey are you okay <laughs> he's like yeah we got to crawl out of here though because who knows if there's like leaking gas or whatever I'll wrap it up real quick, but Jesus. Um, we ended up, uh, without going too crazy into detail, we ended up going to this hotel, and we went to the bar, and I looked in the band's bank account, and we had like $187 left, and I just said, I don't know what we're going to do. All I know is we're going to the bar, and we're going to order every thing they have on the menu, which was like cheeseburgers and nachos. And we're we're gonna get fucked up. Yeah, celebrate life. And we actually ended up one week later. It's a a whole nother story for a whole nother podcast. But we drove a box truck to uh, to Salt Lake City from Oregon with our gear in it. Played one last show, f loaded all of our gear onto the headliners tour bus, flew home, bought another van on Thanksgiving evening, and joined the tour up the next day. Amazing. We finished the tour. Yeah. So that's the time I almost died on tour. <laughs> That's even more terrifying because you had all your your band and crew in there, tour manager and yes, yeah, so crazy. I, I mean, mean, so many other lives. The, the guys had road rash from yeah, the glass, you know, yeah. kind of scraping. Of course, but that was yeah. it. That was it. Everyone was unscathed. That's pretty fortunate that it ended that way, man. That's yeah, great. yeah, yeah. It really highlights like how important it is. People driving vans and buses and everything else. They literally have everybody else's life in their hands with that kind of thing. I think people right. feel that sometimes about drivers and everything else. During our club days, uh, we would always take turns. We would drive Dan's station wagon. We called it the battle dumpster <laughs> <laughs> because there was always just trash on the floor because we were using it as the band of course. Uh, transportation. Of course. And and we'd have like a sound guy and a lighting guy, Carrie and Dave or uh, Dennis working with us, and they would drive the gear up. 
and we would put like our personal instruments in the back of the station wagon. We would just rip up Seattle. We were going to Seattle from Portland. It's about a three hour drive, uh, two and a half if you put them in a pedal down, but going up there and back, you know, cause we would want to save money on hotels. We would get hotels once in a while, but it was always like, go play a gig, play yeah. Friday. Um, if we had a Saturday night gig there too, get a hotel Saturday night and then drive back to Portland so we could all wake up in our, in our homes on Sunday morning. And there was a lot of those drives, you know, where you're just, are you okay to drive? Cause we're going to yeah. crash out and you don't, you don't, you just don't know if you're going to wake up to like screeching tires and yeah. wrapped mm-hmm. around a tree. And there's something you think about constantly, actually. It's yeah. more, it's more sleep deprivation that always Absolute worried me. Time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, Cause no, I've had someone like just doing the whole nodding dog thing at the wheel, which is like terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's the worst. We'd all, we'd all had a drink and there was no other way home and. We basically just had to stay there to keep him awake to get us home. But you yeah. can see that they're going. It's it's terrifying. Yeah. We always had a rule. We would just pull over and <clears throat> whoever was driving, if you started to get tired, you just assured everybody, listen, if I start to get tired, I'm yeah. going to pull over and sleep for an hour. And if we're an hour late, who gives a fuck? Yeah. And that, and that and, and yeah. we and we so but I would say this. We spent we spent about 14 years straight driving around in a van in a trailer. Oh, and that was the old. There. That was the only accident we ever had. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The only accident well, in fourteen my, years I, was the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's yeah. Not good on that one, brother. Yeah. Um yeah, it's uh mine is just a personal thing where I almost broke my back or neck, I guess you could say, where <laughs> we were opening for Eddie Money in Seattle at the Paramount Theater, which was wow. an amazing venue. Amazing club. And yeah. And Ed, I was just a big fan. We used to play Eddie Money songs in high school at proms and stuff in our high school mm-hmm. band, you know. Two tickets to paradise. You know, I was like, oh, Eddie Money, we get to open for him. So we were get, we were rocking it. But one thing that we didn't do, and for all you uh, young bands out there, is always tape down your monitor cables if you're up on a stage, you know, because they act, they love being like log rolls if you step on them mm-hmm. the wrong way. And So I went... At the end of a song, it was the very last hit of a song, you know, do 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 ba bow, that kind of thing. And I went ba bow and did my rock pose at the end of the song. And when the lights came back on, like after two seconds, I was not there. I fell off the holy the shit. Tables rolled. I went into the orchestra pit into it was about fifteen feet down, I guess. <gasps> and it had like metal folding chairs, so I just crashed into there. Oh, God. I got I don't know if you can see it, but I got a huge scar here, and I think there's still some glass. Something was down there where I, it feels oh, like wow. there's stuff in my chin. So uh, I stand up and I got blood all just squirting, like pouring out. They put a napkin up there. I walk back up on the stage. <laughs> I napkin. recognized some of the guys a little bit. I felt like they were a band that I was a fan of. Wow. Like, I, I wow. know these guys. And they said, can you finish the show? And I was like, what do you mean? They go, like, you're singing. And I go, I'm the singer of this band. And I was like, that's, that's fucking cool. It's like a dream come true. And and they, I didn't know if I would know the songs, but when they played them, they were like cover songs. Wow. And I didn't know any of the guys' names. They looked familiar to me. And I was just like, well, we're up here. There's a shitload of people out there. Let's play this song. I got blood. Obviously, something's happened here. And then we had like two more songs <laughs> left. Finished the set. Jesus. On the, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital started coming back a little bit to me. I got a shitload of stitches and all that, but. It's people telling me the story of what went on the other band members over the years that kind of make it uh, stay alive in my mind. That's a so. It sounds like a severe concussion. You know what I mean? Like it sounds like you had actual brain injury. Yeah. I was just so elated though. They they couldn't deny me. I was just like, we're I'm singing in the band. <laughs> yeah. Let's fucking do this. That's you know. Amazing. I was like, that's amazing. And they went into "Baby Don't Fade." I think was the song. I was like, oh. Oh, 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 yeah, I know this no song. No way. That's fucking cool. So, so, so that's almost like experiencing your band from outside the band, which is like, that's also an amazing thing to feel. Can you actually remember being on stage now? Can no. you actually remember those two? No, when my memory came back, whatever yeah. happened before was erased, but they were telling me all about how just excited I was to play music. Yeah. Do you think it was the best show you ever did? <laughs> I have no idea. Performance-wise. There was one show that the network did before we got our record deal out in this out in the boonies outside of Portland. That was probably my favorite show to date. I still remember it where it was it was a club, maybe like a hundred people there or something like that. 
and Friday night or Saturday night. But there was something, I don't know how you know when when your ad lib stuff goes on goes off mm-hmm. and you can really just tap into some weird energy in the universe and no matter what you say or how you say it, it's just funny as fuck. And it's just and it was the in between yeah, yeah. song stuff that all the band was involved in it. We were all and the audience loved it and it was better than the songs. It was like this just big mm-hmm. family comedy show. And that to me is still to date probably my favorite show. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> because we got we got to be stand up comedians for a night, you know. Didn't you get stuck on top of an elevator? Not stuck. Got on there on top on purpose. <laughs> you know, it was but one of those then big... couldn't get off. Well, no, it's just, it's a big atrium, you know, like in a hotel. It was like maybe fifteen floor hotel with a big uh-huh. atrium, open air, and you go in and you check in, and there's these elevators that are exposed on one side. Yeah, that go up. And there was two of them, and I, I just thought it'd be great to get on top of one of those elevators, you know, like you see in a movie or something. Yeah, so I crawled up on, got on top. <laughs> And as soon as it took off, it was pretty fast, faster than I thought. And it went all the way up to the top floor. So I thought it might stop on the third floor or fourth floor. And it was just, (laughs) and I was like, oh, shit. And got up to the point of where there's the metal beam that holds the whole thing together up top. And I guess it was seven or eight inches. But it was like so close. I was like, ah, (laughs) woo. That is a feeling I've never had when looking at an elevator. Like I want to get on top of the elevator. I mean, you never know. There might be some like terrorist attack or a Catholic priest might be jumping on you. You never know when you need to get away. <laughs> yeah, this is what I tell anybody because I live in Capitol Hill in D.C. And, and obviously the question of terrorist attack or with the elections this week, tomorrow, um, people talk about militias and stuff. And people always have these like exit strategies. They're like, all right, I have a handgun. I have a go bag with an axe. I have a lighter and rope. We're going to take this road out of town. I got- I'm like, I'm just going <laughs> to die. Wow. I'm just going to fucking die if something happens. You I'm can not, join me I'm on not, top of the elevator. Yeah, we'll no, hide. Dan, you can jump onto an elevator. We'll I'm just going to I'm going to die. That's it. And I'm fine with it. I'm fucking you're just totally too lazy fine to care. That's the real it's issue. It's not you lazy. Just, it's not lazy. You, it's just you're like intelligent I, enough to have an exit plan. You just choose not I to. I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses <laughs> and and fighting back against a terrorist attack ain't one of them. Or I'm running just, from one. Yeah, I mean, running, like, like, let's say you're at a cafe and there's a terrorist attack. Like, running from one, I'm just going to take the yeah. last bite of my delicious hamburger. I'm going to swig <laughs> the beer, and I'm going to accept my impending doom. And if you believe in reincarnation, you're, you're back in three days anyway, you know. Exactly, and so the last minutes of your existence on this earthly plane, you want to be running in fear? I'm just going to sit there and fucking take it. <laughs> I like it. So what have, you been, what have you been doing all this running for? Are you not training for, like, escaping a terrorist attack? <laughs> no, I'm training so you'll quit telling me to stop running. <laughs> I'm ru- I'm running from annoyance. <laughs> you start to look like the rock like when that happened. So Dario had me in the gym. Dan, you still look fucking really good, man. I'm just doing push-ups and pull-ups at home a little bit, but I'm st- I'm eating too much pizza again this last few months. Especially when I started working on the film uh with in earnest this music film we're working on and, um, uh, and being in the edit editing room the last month, like mm-hmm. I haven't been getting much exercise at all. Hey, well, you know what? I'm just going to let you both die. Like this is the last time I try and help anybody. All I do is get shit for like trying to make sure you guys are okay. I still eat, I still eat avocado and I still eat avocado and scrambled eggs. Let me tell you something, Dan. If that's if what you, you if what you're doing is eating pizza and staying up late, and you look that good, I, you I I'll take it. I'm doing I mean, avocado in the morning, so you know with right. You know, Dario's. Recipe. I would still totally let you just pound me. I would totally <laughs> let you just just fucking destroy me. If you wanted to take me, I would let you do it. I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. Well, you know, we're gonna be on tour oh, again man. soon. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we're, just gonna get, we're just going to get... Is there something that happened? Pounded. Did something happen in Sweden that you just didn't tell me about? No, but we've, no. we flirted a lot. Yeah, yeah but bet. that's the whole thing. It's You don't just you don't just let Dan Reed fuck you on the first night. I got to <laughs> show him that I'm I'm witty and I'm funny, and then I get on stage and I sing a little bit, and he's more interested, and then I'm See, more now interested. now you start talking it's dirty. A I, I got to have a cigarette now, you know? You should have a cigarette. God, that's hot. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Dari, you should take up smoking. Look how fucking good this guy looks. He's over here smoking cigarettes. You're just sitting there doing I nothing. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. <sighs> Amazing. All right. So we got, we had your best gig experience. Is there such thing as a bad show? Have you had a worst gig experience? Yeah, of course. There's always... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, opening for the Rolling Stones in Italy. Wow. In tu- Turin. Turin, Italy. Mm-hmm. Um, I had heard horror stories where uh, Prince got booed off the stage opening for the Rolling Stones. And Jesus. And Prince is a hero of mine. Like, how could you boo off Prince, you know? But it was back mm-hmm. when he was wearing high heels and panties and a long purple jacket before Purple Rain. And I think yep. the rock and roll yep. audience, the Harley guys and all that was just like, what is this shit, man, you know? So mm-hmm. they had issues with that, but we did, we had a pretty good experience on that whole tour, except in Turin, they were uh, throwing mm-hmm. water bottles at us and they did not want an opening band. They wanted the goddamn Rolling Stones and they wanted them now. And Melvin wow. got, Melvin got hit. His bass shorted out because it got hit by water, water bottle that exploded. Um, I remember somebody flipping us off right in the front row. And I grabbed his finger, and I think I tried my best to break it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but he was he was pretty elastic, that kid. <laughs> wow. You know, we were he was probably same age as me. I was like twenty six or seven, and he was the same age as me. But he was like, "Fuck you!" Mm-hmm. And I'm like, just thinking, we're just playing music, dude. And he wouldn't stop. And so I just grabbed his finger, and I was like, "I'll show you, fuck you!" And it just bent backwards, and he was fine. <laughs> that attitude is so strange to me always with the with the animosity towards the opening band because it's like dude there's a finite amount of time we're going to be up here it's not like yeah you were tricked and we swapped yeah. places with the headliner yeah. it's like in 20 minutes this is going to be over yeah it's on the poster it's in the advertisements yeah that wasn't about the way you dressed or like the fact that like it was the makeup of the band or the songs you were playing it was literally just because they wanted to see the stones yeah i mean it could be i i was one of the few musicians that had my head shaved at that time too Uh so maybe it was a guy who thought i was a nazi with black guys on stage yeah singing songs about like the universal consciousness of love and understanding okay (laughs) i mean maybe who knows i get it i got so much hate mail when i did that you know like people saying that you know uh shaving your head is like killing dolphins i'll never listen to your music again Jesus Christ. <laughs> People are mental. There's so much unchecked mental illness in the world. It's just in the world. fucking crazy. Probably in the West more than... I've Yeah, but I've just never thought, like, never once in my life have I thought... I mean, I've definitely looked at a person and been like, that guy's got a stupid fucking haircut. No question. Right. But I've yeah, never yeah. been so compelled to, like, tell them or compare their haircut to the death of a sacred animal or something yeah. <laughs> fucking crazy. Or judge their music by their looks. I mean, how many musicians did we grow up listening to that weren't lookers, you know? All of them. <laughs> that's yeah, all that's of what them. I'm saying. What can you but do? But now it's all about this image thing. It's pretty trippy, you know? So Yeah. I, Narcissism I, has totally engulfed the idea I, of, of art, you know? I thought that was part of the reason why you kind of like shaved your head in the first place because of the way the industry was going and. Yeah, I kind of wanted to stir things up. I just didn't think it was going to make people um, that angry. You know, there was, Mm -hmm. it made my, our management, our attorneys, our accountants, our agents, our crew, everybody that worked at the record label fucking livid. Yeah. I've never, I've never been cussed out so much in my life, screamed at, yelled at over the phone. That's so crazy. And in, in, in forever. We were in San Francisco. We were filming the video for Rainbow Child the next day. And we were at a hotel the night before. And I said, you know what? Rainbow Children back in the 60s was about long hair. In the 70s. It was, that was being a rebel. Right. Having long hair. Now, having long hair is just a fashion statement for anything. It's like, so I was like, I'm gonna, and I had the longest hair. <laughs> Yeah. So I shaved it all off thinking, this is the future rainbow child vibe, you know, like get rid of your ego. And I had read a quote by Gandhi saying that the reason monks keep their hair short and their nails short is so that it makes you check your ego. You're not looking in the mirror every day of how you look. Wow. And I thought that's what I, that's the reason. So I took it all off and I had to wear If anybody that's watching this, if you want to check out the rainbow child video from 1980. 
nine uh, on YouTube, you'll see I'm wearing this Valentino headdress thing because the label said we wouldn't they wouldn't put the money in making the video unless I covered up my head. That's so crazy. I mean, they they did they, they basically did the same thing to Sinead O'Connor, you know, in the in the mid '80s when she shaved her head and was like, "Fuck all of you people." The backlash was insane at a time where she was literally making the best music of her whole career, her whole life. And then she went on Saturday Night Live and ripped up a picture of the Pope. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, I remember it. Yeah. So, and that was the end of her career in American radio. You know, how dare you mm -hmm. insult? Right. The priests right. that are abusing our children. Yeah. And and she was doing War by Bob Marley. You know, she was, yeah. I mean, which, and the lyrics are literally just a speech from Haile Selassie, you know, that he read to the UN. And it's like, it, it, it's just so weird, I guess, when artists are behaving like the artists. And yeah. then people, yeah. and then people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, what are you, what's yeah. going on here? It's like, I don't yeah, know. Roger, like Roger Waters. Uh, Defending the Palestinians, for example, I see so much hatred about Roger Waters being, uh, you know, someone who hates Jews. And he's like, no, man. I've n and I said, give me one example where he said he hates Jewish people. Right. He's saying he's against Israeli governmental practices. A hundred percent. That's a different thing. I, I abhorred George Bush going to war with Iraq and Afghanistan and, and starting these crazy wars over potentially these Saudis, nine out of 14 were Saudi Arabians, were chumming up with Saudi, but were willing to blow up Afghanistan and Iraq. Right. I hated it, but that doesn't mean I hate America because I, I, I dislike George Bush's policies. Right. You know, well, it's like you don't hate Jews yeah. because you're against the governmental practices. It's just- Yeah, I've of, thought about the Roger Waters thing, not because I'm Jewish, but I've thought a lot about it. I, I, he's completely right. He's completely right in terms of an oppressive um, Israeli government stance towards Palestinians. It's disgusting. But the one thing that I disagree is his stance of boycotting. Right? You've been to you've been to Israel. You've been to Tel Aviv. You've been to Jerusalem. The young people there. I think the most cowardly thing you can do as an artist is boycott a place that needs he your needs message. You. Exactly. Yep. And they would all buy tickets and they would all go to his shows. And I've never heard more open-minded liberal thought than living in Jerusalem and hanging out with the young hippie Jewish kids, you know? Just, sure, sure. They're just like, yeah, dude, what's going on with the Palestinians isn't right. But, you know, there's, and they give you actual reasons because they all were in the military at some point. So they all had mm -hmm. some right. version of uh, understanding how that's right as well. Yeah. So they, they have a really good... <laughs> overview of both sides of the situation right but could you imagine bob marley like being like i'm not gonna go play to a soccer stadium in africa because of the government he's like yeah no, he's he's no. bigger than the government you know what i mean yeah. like that's that should always be the view like yeah living there i remember there was some artists that were canceling playing in israel at the time and i was there for a little over three years and i was like oh man you guys are missing this opportunity to speak to the open-minded people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that goes also back to what's happening, especially in America now, where the the um, the the dissolving of discourse, people are not willing to discuss things anymore in any format o over a length of time. It's just simply black. Everything's black and white. There's no yep. discussion. And I think that's where where we've lost the nuance, especially in, in art. An yeah. artist should be allowed to say controversial things in a, in a forum, especially playing a show in Tel Aviv and speaking your mind about what's happening. That is a protest that you're making way more impact. You wouldn't get back into Israel again if you did that, if they heard about it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. As, but then you've as, made the great, you've made the yeah. point. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Did exactly. it, did it bother you that reaction you got? to cutting your hair i think my feelings were just hurt a little bit you know mm -hmm. like i i thought um making it about the music i i thought shaving my hair off would make it more about the music and it actually made it yeah. like this new thing yeah mm -hmm. this new kind of fashion statement and and i was thinking <sighs> the the hatred and the anger i felt i felt a little depressed and sad about that i felt maybe a little too much pride 
when I got messages saying, that's the shit, man. That's ballsy. That's courageous. That's, you know, rock on, motherfucker. You know, that kind of stuff. And I felt like, oh, that's cool. Uh, and then and then I also felt sad. <laughs> so they kind of balanced out. When you're in your, you know, late 20s or mid 20s, your ego still, I mean, most people's egos is still pretty strong. <laughs> yeah. So, so do, do you think artistically then always, you got to always do the thing that feels right to you and kind of don't even take into consideration the repercussions of, of, the, of that thing? I feel that way now. Um, I wish I had more courage to write lyrics that were revolutionary. Um, I feel right. that I, the diet of music that I grew up around and with starting with Frank Sinatra on Sundays with my mom playing records that I still like songs taking you away and being romantic and being illusory and, and, and creating some kind of unreal world a little bit, you know, yeah. where yeah. it's a little optimistic, it's a little idealistic, it's a little fantastic, um, a little romantic. Uh, when you start getting into politics too heavily, I wrote a song, um, I don't know if you remember 99 Lashes, uh, Dario, mm -hmm. about, about uh, sung from the point of the view of the executioner, like yeah. sung from the point of view of the person that whips the women who uh, supposedly cheat on their husband or want a divorce in certain corners of the world, sung by the person that you know, chops someone's head off you know, or holds the keys to a jail cell that's, uh, in, uh, that's imprisoning an activist. You know, that has mm -hmm. done nothing violent, just wanted to make the world a better place. Yeah. <laughs> and I sing that song at shows and people come up to me and, and I can see people in the audience in tears once in a while. And I'm just not, sh I like doing that once in a while, mm -hmm. but I don't have the courage to be that artist 100% of the time. And I, I wish I did because I think the world, uh, the world needs it a little bit. I don't think you need to be revolutionary all the time. I just think that whatever you're saying needs to come from an honest place. You can still tell a tale and create a, a fantasy yeah. for somebody as long as it's it's genuine and it's honest. I think that's where people really start relating to stuff if there's some sort of truth to it, I think. Yeah, but I, I think, I don't know. I think it's super badass when you do something impactful and important enough that it gets you fucking killed. <laughs> you know, like Lincoln, yeah. like ML, like MLK, like Malcolm X, when he switched his point of view, Malcolm, no one was going to kill Malcolm X until he started saying, Hey, I was wrong. Blacks and whites mm -hmm. should work together. Yeah. No, yeah. Lo 100%. no longer kill whitey. Boom. Done. He's out. Mm -hmm. JFK. I, yeah. Robert, his brother who wrote those speeches. Yeah. Medgar Fox. Evers, the list goes on. I mean, shit, John Lennon, say John what you Lennon. want. That's what I'm saying. So I wish I had the balls to like try to donate to that pot more. But I think I think like it to me and I know I've mentioned him a couple of times but for to me it always comes back to like Bob Marley, right? Yeah. If you think about if you think about it he's probably the most popular artist of all time internationally I mean globally speaking. He's I I think mm -hmm. he's light He's light. He's light years above Michael Jackson in terms of like visibility and still being to this day like a relevant artist. So, so, so to me, it always comes back to Marley because Marley is the guy on the same record who wrote, you know, Concrete Jungle and Get Up, Stand Up, right? Mm -hmm. And then on this yeah. on the same record, he would go, "Turn your lights down low and open up your yeah. window curtain." So to me, it's like, it's like. I think there's space, especially for an artist like you, Dan, there's a lot of space to do both things because mm. that is, that it, it, I almost find, and, and this is not disparaging to Rage Against the Machine. They're one of my favorite bands, but I find their, st their thing to be a little disingenuous in mm. the sense that they're millionaires, right? So they're like, right. they're like, we got to fight the system and we're going to put out this this big political summer tour to fight the system. Tickets are $250 if you're lucky. It's like, That's, to me, yeah. I love Tom Morello. I love Zach De La Roca. They're an amazing yeah. fucking band, right? But aren't there other right. aspects to, aren't there other aspects to being a human being, right? 
Like you, you're, mm-hmm. Malcolm X wasn't a revolutionary 100% of the time. He was a, a husband and a father yeah. too. Yeah, it's true. So I think there's really this room to be human, which I do think, Dan, is something you have achieved quite remarkably in your records. It's a, hu- it's a human experience. Yeah. Well, it's good to hear. Thank you, sir. I mean, I've also crashed a van. I've like almost killed several people in a van crash. So I, I don't know what my I don't know what my opinion means, but I mean, I no, think that's the truth. I lot, think more man. artists can embrace. Like, for instance, like it's funny because you look at a band. You know, you look at several sta- big stadium bands, and you're like, when did they lose the thing that? It's just it's it can be both things. Yeah, yeah but that's all the process, isn't it? That you're young and hungry and you write the record where you sound young and hungry, but that's the thing that makes you a millionaire and then you either yeah. grow and evolve and change your, your tact. Like, you can't stay the same band forever, really, like, unless, you know, you are someone like Bob. Like, I, it's just, it's almost impossible because you change as a human being and now you have a completely different life to the one you had when you were 19 and poor and writing a record that really fucking meant something to you. Yeah. Stopping through drive through to feed the whole band as opposed to going to fancy restaurants because now you have the money or not even hanging out with the band anymore because everyone's independently wealthy. They get together to write a record. But before you were like this family that thought, you know, came up with ideas together or just bullshitted it together and yeah. you were a family. And when you become millionaires, the family starts splintering off into their own mansions and it must be difficult. <laughs> but I, I, that that always makes me think very, uh, real quickly of this of the Sabbath bloody Sabbath story where you know the guys a- achieved this monumental success and they went yeah. from being the best friends in the world spending every day together they're poor they're just struggling and yeah. then all of a sudden their band achieves this worldwide success and they don't know how to write songs anymore mm. so they they go into this basement of this castle that they rented they go into the basement of this big manor and they just fucking turn off all the lights they light some candles. And Tony Iommi just starts playing this. They haven't spoken to each other in a year, okay? Mm-hmm. And then they get into this basement, and Tony Iommi just starts playing a riff, and they're like, all right, this is, this is what we're here to do. And they fucking wrote the whole, the whole Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath record in, in a day. You know, in two that days. Basement. That's great. That's so, great. like, that, that, you know, I think it is possible. I think what you said before about ego is probably the... That's probably yeah. the thing, is your ego is, prevents you ultimately from being honest with yourself more than it is being honest with other people yeah yeah i mean i wish like richie sambor and john bon jovi were still writing songs together that would be cool maybe they could write like a cool record again you know (laughs) of course they could of course they could because one's the brains and one's the soul of a band to me i think there's everybody has their own role you know there's the gunslinger and then there's the bartender (laughs) everybody kind of so, interesting, yeah. Have you got a worst uh, gig experience for me, Nate? Before we move yeah, on, yeah, Nate. Honestly, I have too. I have too many. I mean, I. I we, <laughs> All right, then. is I, there such I, a I, thing? Is is there such a thing as a bad show? Hell yes. <laughs> Fuck yeah! And anyone who says there's not such thing as a bad show is a fucking literal liar. They're lying to you. There's. T- I've had more. I, I'll put it this way. Put it this way. This is totally true. In 18 years of of touring. I've had more bad shows than good. And I think yeah. if you're if you're if you say you've had more good shows than bad, you're not learning yeah. anything. That's I don't true. mean bad show like bad for the audience or miserable or anything like that. I just mean like a good show is a show that is executed from a place of honesty between you and the crowd and it it all the technicals go right and the the exchange of energy was pure. That's mm-hmm. a fucking rare thing. Mm-hmm. That doesn't always happen. Like it just doesn't, and I'm not under the illusion that it's supposed to. Does so, a bad had... show mean that you don't enjoy it, or no? That no, it's like it's like pizza and sex and all the other cliche things. It's like <laughs> you know what At I mean. Least... It's like it, even if it's bad, or sorry, in your case, like a, a like a nice curry, like a lamb curry. <laughs> if it's bad, if it's bad, it's still pretty good. You know what I mean? Like uh-huh. you're still. I, I, I'm not above. I'm not so delusional that I'm like, uh, what a misery to be. I mean, it's a listen. You're in another country and it's great, and you've had a great day, or the, this one song went great. But that, you know, the truth is, it's really hard to pull off a, a full hour and thirty minutes of per- perfection. I mean, it's vi- those shows are rare to me. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I mean, we learned early on with the network to celebrate the mistakes that happen, the gear breaking down. We make fun yeah. of it. We pray to it. We do yeah. like a <laughs> chant to the gear and pray it comes back to life. And the audience loves that shit. Yeah. I used to get, you know, uh, like everybody, when the stuff would break down, the crew wasn't on it. I mean, like, you get like, how come that symbol stand's still on the fucking floor? You know, that kind of shit. Let it go. And that's like, I got over that stuff early. You know, like during the club days, by the time we were assigned, we were just goofballs on stage having fun. But they're the bits the audience remembers more than anything. Mm. They'll remember the night that, like, the lead came out with Brian's guitar and he's trying to solo and nothing's happening. Or, you know, they're the bits because that's what makes yeah. it individual. That's the whole point of going to a live show as opposed to listening to the record that there is that element of danger. Anything can happen. And that's why, like, especially like bands that play with like loads of tracks and everything else, like, mm. there's got to be a live element to it. That's what people go for is that the unknown. Oh. We use tracks a lot, you know, with like half of our set, we have backing tracks that drummer Dan's playing uh, to click track and stuff. So we welcome technology breaking down. And if this, if it does break down, we can play the song without it. That's not a problem. But I do like that kind of techno sound. I love synth bass along with the bass guitar. I just love that sound. And unless we hired another keyboard player um, to play play it, you know, live, like 70s style um then you're talking another hotel room you're talking you know it's just i'd like percussion players and background singers and horn players i'd love all that stuff but i went to go see uh, john mayer in london uh last year and he had a huge band i think it was like i don't when i say huge i mean like nine ten people on stage yeah and it was great it was i i love that sound that big full sound um, but there's something about, you know, when you pare it down even more and more, you get to hear each instrument a little more. Um, like even a trio is, is when I play with Ikus and Bangin, so those are some of my favorite shows because I'm the only guitar player on stage and I'm not very good, but I try to just be passionate about it, you know? You're a pretty great guitar player, Don, it's fine. Well, I mean, I just enjoy the, being yeah. like the... The mistakes, if they're there, you get to hear them, you know? Mm -hmm. There's nowhere to hide. Nowhere to hide. I like that stuff. Makes it fun. All right. This is probably the most budget bit. I wanted to do this a little fancier, but I mean, I know, especially coming from you, because you used a Tibetan singing bowl to uh, do random yeah, draws. Yeah, I draw. Yeah, it's actually, where is it? It's over on the other desk, yeah. I got a cup. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Western um, singing bowl. But at least it's a cup from like a show that I did with Eagle Eye in Rio. So at least it's like vaguely related oh, to touring. Cool. It's a cool so looking cup. I'm going to um, pull a random topic out and we're just going to see what happens. And if I'm hoping that somebody's got a good story to go with it. Um, all right. <coughs> Meeting fans. How are you? I mean, this is actually pretty cool because both of you guys are pretty great at meeting fans and hanging out with them. Um, have you got any good, bad, indifferent experiences of meeting fans um, whilst you're out on the road? Oh, God. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I'll just... Um, most people are very cool. Most people are super cool. I'm super happy to meet most people. And once in a while, you come... Early on in the, day, in the touring days of Lion Eyes, we would... Sp we would stay at fans or houses or people that we met at the show, we would crash at their house. And that ended, I mean, we did that for like five years and you know, it just, w one time we stayed in South Carolina, we stayed, I can't, I won't say her name, but she, she, we got in her place. We, we hunkered down to sleep and we hear this like clanging and she's like, don't go to bed yet guys. I want to show you something really cool. And she comes out, this is no joke, she comes out in full chain mail and a sword. And she's Jesus like, Christ. she's like, do you guys want a LARP? Right? Like, it's like three in the morning. So I'm like, no, I don't want a LARP. I don't know what LARPing is. I don't fucking care. This is insane. Then I, then I hold the sword. Live action role playing is LARPing. So like, you know, you, you, okay. Then I hold the sword and I'm thinking, uh, this girl's... The sword was a real sword, and it was razor sharp. Wow! So I was like, I was like, so so I said, I said, I told everybody, I was like, we we, we gotta go, we gotta yeah, go, for sure. Then 
she proceeds to start telling us all these racist stories. And I don't know why. She's like holding a sword and wearing this chain mail and like spouting off this crazy racist stuff. So we ended up, she was a fan too, so it was terrible. But we ended up just getting back in the van and just rolling. Just like three in the morning out to the next town. But I will say I'm very grateful for everybody I've met. For the 99.99%, everybody's super cool. But that was an instance where we were not stoked. There's not like she wasn't like chasing you down the road with a sword. No, and but she mail. was like, she was like, all right, I'm gonna go take the chainmail off, and then we'll watch a movie and go to bed. And I was like, oh nope, we're out. Oh, wow. We all one by one like tiptoed, you know, out, and we left. That's the wisest thing you've ever done. Oh my god, yeah. it's so fucking crazy. So that was it. I mean, other than that, it's not, you know, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, I have, there's just too many stories. I don't even know where to start. You know, from skinny dipping at 3 a.m. in Sweden during the winter, you know, like freezing cold water. And But you're both pretty good with people who come to shows. Like, you both give up a lot of time after shows to hang out with people. Oh, I love, yeah. Go for drinks afterwards, kind of generally yeah. happens. Like, you got, like, a good yeah. night out that you can remember, or? Well, my, my favorite moments... I've, over the last decade is when I've had a couple really hardcore heavy metal guys come to my acoustic shows because they saw the Dan Reed Network open for Bon Jovi or, or the Stones back in the day and they got the Slayer shirt on and, and they come to the show and and after the set, have them come up to me. It's happened twice over the last decade, but those are very special moments to me when they come up and they're angry. They're actually quite angry at me. They're just like, you know what? I just want to say, fuck you. And I'd be like, oh, you, this is like, we're, we're, are we fighting now? <laughs> what is this, like UFC time? And he goes, you made me cry tonight, so fuck you. You know, and, and but they really mean it from their heart. And it's kind of like, it's saying thank you in the only way they know how to say it. I witnessed that in Sweden a couple of times, actually. To, on, on multiple nights, there was like some Swedish heavy metal, like heavy metal dudes that had beards and they were big and they were just yeah. like badass motherfuckers. Yep. And then they'd come up after the set and they'd be like, Dan Reed, you're the best. <laughs> you're amazing. Uh, but you, know, you get one of those guys to cry. They, yes. they don't like it. No, man. they were moved. They were moved the whole set. It blew me away watching that happen. That I can verify that yeah. that's totally, totally real. Were you doing your cover of Holy Diver? Was that what like set them off? No, I mean that I mean sure that might help. I don't play it that much <laughs> the last few years, but I just uh Oh, that's another one of my favorite shows was playing Sweden Rock when I first came back to music a decade ago. Um I was Offered to play. It was between Bachman Turner Overdrive and what's that crazy band that dresses up and spits blood? Uh, Wasp. So Bachman Turner Overdrive, Dan Reed with his acoustic guitar, who hasn't been in the music business for 15 years. Weird. And Wasp. Love it. Love it. And Dio had just died like a week prior or two weeks prior to this event. <sighs> and I played Holy Diver as the first song. And they were just acoustic rock, yeah, we love acoustic rock. <laughs> they were on on my side the whole time. I got like three encores. They eventually said I had I had to stop playing in the third encore because Wasp wanted to start their set, and totally understandable. But <laughs> when, when I was when I was coming out to before I came out to Portland to meet you for the first time, I I had seen that video. You know, it's on YouTube, and it fucking blew me away. Oh, really? Yeah, it's on YouTube. I mean, you can go watch you do that performance. It's fucking Damn. crazy. It's oh, wow. crazy. I've never seen it. Yeah, it's it's pivotal. It's I mean, it's like a real tangible experience to watch that, even on YouTube, on the computer. I was in it. tears after the set back in the dress, dressing trailer. Yeah. I was just like, God, did that really happen? You know, because I, I was terrified to do that show. Yeah. Wow, really? Yeah, man. Fuck this whole, everybody's in black rock shirts. Yeah, yeah. Bachman Turner Overdrive just played. Now I'm going to come out and play Coming Up for Air. <laughs> and On Your Side. And I, On Your Side. I was like, I'm going to get fucking pummeled here. If you're great, it th that's the one thing I will say about spending a lot of time not being in a metal band, but playing to metal audiences. Mm. They're the best audiences in the world. Because they're super open-minded. Yeah. And, and it just has it's to true. be good. That's the only rule. That's the only real rule for metal, right? 
Because, yeah. like, mm-hmm. like, Lita Ford sings power ballads, right? Yeah. And then Motorhead yeah. plays basically Chuck Berry punk rock style music. Yeah. But it's all metal. You know what I mean? It's all, like, if it's good, it's good. That's my thought. They like a good melody. They like a good chorus. And you, you sing know? your ass off. I mean, it's yeah. all metal's about the vocals, too. Yeah. I mean, True. do you regularly get terrified before a show? No, that's uh, that one. Um, I think our first Stones show was terrifying. The first Bon Jovi show, no. When we were touring with them, I was just like, yeah, this is totally up our alley, you know? I, I didn't have a problem with that. But open for the Stones, I had heard all these horror stories. Jimi Hendrix and Prince, you know, getting booed. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> okay, here we go. Nate, you ever terrified? Um, the most terrified I have ever been was um, doing Red Rocks in, in Denver. Oh, wow. Um, we were the backing band for Lee Scratch Perry. Um, wow. And we, he, was the, he, he was going on before Steel Pulse as the – it was a co-headline basically. 10,000 people sold out. And Lee Perry was flying from show to show, and we were driving our fucking van like 16 hours overnight every day. So we show up, of course, he's 45 or 50 minutes late, and they have, it's because it's a national park, they have a, 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 a sound limit, they have to, mm-hmm. they, they have to stop, curfew. yeah, they have a hard curfew. So they're like, well, you guys gotta go on stage right now and, 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 and play, like, dub, like, play some Lee Perry songs and get the crowd warmed up for 20, 30 minutes, and then he'll, 20, uh, 30. He, right. And he'll arrive, <laughs> and he'll just walk on, and then you start to set. This is what the, the GM of Red Rocks is telling me. So I thought about it for a minute, and I go to the guys in the band, and I say, I'm going to do something right now that's so fucking stupid. Just just follow my lead, as I've done many times. <laughs> I said that exact same sentence. So I went up to the GM, and I said, here's the deal. We're in a band called Lion Eyes, and we're going to go on and do a set, and you're going to introduce us as Lion Eyes at oh, 10 p.m. on a Saturday night at Red Rocks. You're going to introduce us. And then when Lee gets here, we'll walk back off stage, come back on with him, and we can do the Lee set. And the guy goes, no fucking way. We've never heard of you. We don't know what your music sounds like. Who the fuck are you? And I'm like, You're, we're the we're, band. You just want to play 20 minutes. We're the band. Yeah. So, <laughs> so take it or leave it. You can, you, can have, you can have a DJ play or you can have the crowd just sit here fucking pissed off for 45 minutes or whatever till Lee gets yeah. here. Or we can go up there and do it. And the guy goes and I see him talking to like a circle of production people and blah, 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 blah. And he walks back over and he goes, this might be the last time you ever play Red Rock, so good luck. He said that? <laughs> yeah, straight up. And we went up. That's amazing. And we went up and we fucking destroyed it. I mean, it was just one of those shows where we were like, we could probably we could probably make a run at this. Like we, you know, and it went well. And then of course, like clockwork, 30 minutes late, Lee Perry gets there. We walk off stage, come back on with them. Nobody even realized that we were the same people. And we, yeah. and we did it. That's amazing. And I was terrified. I called, I called my parents up before the set and I go, all right, there's 10,000 people. We're about to go play the show. I don't know if I'm going to puke or shit my pants or both. I'm very, I'm sick to my stomach, but I'm going to go do this. And they were like, go get them. And the crowd bought it? Yeah. Crowd totally. Yeah, half and half. With a reggae crowd, it's like they're either like totally mentally ill or they're there to hear good music. <laughs> it's one or the other. You know what I mean? It's people who are like purists or they're not. That brings up an interesting point about uh, like fighting for your space, you know, like as an artist as opposed to – because yeah. I, I don't know if, how you are, Nate, in your, you know, writing time and stuff, but – I always feel that it's it's good to have some humility as a as a performer when you, especially meeting fans and all this kind of stuff and not charging a thousand bucks to get your picture taken with them and all that shit. It's like yeah. just yeah. being grateful that we get to be musicians. A hundred percent. And there takes a lot of humility and, and, and just to be able to be live in that gratefulness, right? Right. But at the same time, you're writing music that you want people to hear. You want to be able to tour and make a living off of it. You want to sell some merchandise to put gasoline in the tank and not like Danny Vaughn says. And it's true. And and so you have to have a certain amount of ego um, 
so they're both fighting each other. The artist side of you is going one direction and then there's the marketing person on the other side, you know, it's got to go out there and hit the streets and pedal it. Right? right. And if you can right. figure out how to intertwine them and be at peace with that. Yeah. It's, it's a, I think it's a valid uh, place for every artist to reach for, you know, that's the bit I love. If I can help an artist do something creatively, that's also like financially successful at the same time. And it's mm -hmm. honest. Like that's yeah. literally what I try and help yeah. guys with sometimes is that that magic bit in between where it's it's both. Yeah. I think that's it's really hard for artists to do that because you want to make something honest that isn't about making money, but you have to live at the same time. Right. Whereas I can at least consider both and try and push you in a direction that might do that. That was like the whole origins thing in the first place and like cutting that record in that kind of way was how can we fund a, a really cool creative thing that's going to give something back to people. And it pay for itself. You've been a godsend in my life, Dario. Don't, <laughs> don't, Dan, don't do <laughs> that. Don't do Seriously, that, Dan. Though, you know, like being in my, doing my solo stuff for, you know, kind of, and I work with Tony Metcalf, who's amazing, you know, and there's a lot of people that have come along, but your uh, dedication to this band and your great ideas and always kind of pushing me to do stuff out of the comfort zone, stuff that I would never think of, um, has been just perfect because it's really allowed me to bury myself in the studio here and work on music or screenplay writing. I'm working on the film that we just shot. Um, it just allows me to be more artistic. And my girlfriend, she allows me to like not worry about taxes and she, she covers accounting and all that. That stuff drives me nutty. Booking flights and trains and being online and, oh, it logged me out because I was taking too long to make a decision on my flight and yeah. fuck you i just get so angry at technology mentally i don't actually smash anything but i get really just ugh. and uh it's amazing how similarly impatient the pair of you are with shit like that it's incredible <laughs> like, how like how calm you are most of the time and then like it's like a switch and you what's the password the fucking password <laughs> yeah yeah I, I i was thinking it just kind of hit me dan what you said before about there's that juxtaposition between yeah. art and commerce and mm -hmm. I think the only thing that I've really learned over the course of uh, 15 16 years doing it 18 years but you want to be available to people's opinions and options and you want to be open like being a great artist means being open yeah but it also means not giving a fuck and I've learned over the course of, of my career, I used to want to please everyone. I wanted to please a manager. I wanted to please the label. I wanted to please this, that, the other. I don't give a fuck anymore. I yeah, want to do the thing I want to do. And that's why I'm an artist in the first place. Yeah. Because I don't want to be told what I can and can't do. I only want to do the thing that I want to do because that's what makes me happy. I got fucking maybe, if I'm lucky, another 40 years left on the plane. Mm. I, 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 that's it. Like... Mm. I'm, yeah. That's why I wake up late. That's why I don't set an alarm. Because I fucking don't like waking up early. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't set an alarm either. Unless I got a, a Skype yeah, call. Yeah, if you have like something. This, yeah, like, if you have something to do, I it's get 7 it. Seven p.m. I just mean exactly. like, I mean the idea of living to please other people because you want to sell more records. I mean that's like why there are yeah. the Justin Bieber's of the world. That's why yeah. those people exist because they're there to please everyone. I don't want to. <laughs> it's weird now as you have people on YouTube. Like YouTubers, reviewing YouTubers. Yeah, crazy. So they'll have YouTuber on the screen, and that YouTuber's talking about something. You remember how you used to stand in a bathroom that had two like mirrors that could fold in on each other? And if you, yeah. you stood there and you would just go off into infinity? Yeah. Like your image gets smaller and smaller and you just go off into yeah. infinity? That's what the, some of these YouTube... Uh, it's like, that's a career. People are making thousands and thousands yeah. of dollars a month reviewing a reviewer's review but but can you remember the last time that you were into something because it was marketed to you or like someone told you to check it out you know what i mean so yeah. that's still to me that's the key it's it, you the it piece, true. It, if you're do uh, someone put it the, the best i i heard this um podcast that i love um tim, he's a comedian and he has a great podcast his name is tim dylan and he basically just said, if you're doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing and you believe in it, the world yeah. catches up to you. You can never chase the yeah. tail yeah. of the world. It's true. It either, it either finds you or it doesn't because the thing you're doing, nobody wants it. And that's fine, too. That's fine. 
Absolutely. But it, but it'll, it'll yeah. find you if it if and if it doesn't, you can always go. You can you could review YouTube videos of YouTube reviewers reviewing YouTubers. That would be no, funny. Be reviewing you, you could be reviewing YouTubers reviewing. Review yeah, you on need, yeah, you. you need more pot for that, but yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm gonna review my own vi music videos. I love it, guys. I have to run right now. All right, man. This yeah, Dan, sorry this we is, didn't talk about touring more, but we did. We covered it a little bit here and there. We'll, some stuff. We'll, we'll go back to it. We'll talk. There's more no rules. Uh, yeah, I definitely think there will be scope to have another chat at some point. This has been great. Sounds good. Um, I would like thank that. you very much for coming on, man. I really do appreciate your time. Dan, it it's great to see you. I love you and I miss you, and I, I am excited too, to guys. see when this all this shit goes away. Yes, please, Nate. We'll be on the road again soon. I hope. Yeah. We have to. In plastic bubbles. There's a band that just did a. Sh show at the big they were all in plastic bubbles the audience and the band yeah i saw that flaming lips it looked pretty yeah. it looked pretty amazing you could hot just, you could hot box that bad boy i was thinking that'd be cool too but god <laughs> imagine when they unzip all those balloons at the end of the show the <laughs> smell <laughs> okay I sick thinking about it i love you guys <laughs> all right guys be safe right. i love you guys take care all right talk Bye. soon talk Bye. soon guys peace thank you for tuning in to the latest episode of tour talk as always, you can find us across the socials at Tua Talk Pod. That's Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Patreon too. Peace!